Hello fans, we're taking a brief moment to recognize and show our appreciation for the incredible support of our sponsors. Their commitment not only fuels our content, but also ensures we can bring you the very best of the airgun world. Firstly, a huge shout out to Southern Precision Air Weapons. Ken is a master of hard-hitting airgun tunes that deliver unrivaled accuracy. Moving on, we extend our gratitude to High Pressure Pneumatics. Be sure to check out what Tom has going on at his store in Michigan and online as well. Let's not forget the remarkable contribution of Donnie FL. Their innovations in suppressors have revolutionized the experience in the field, combining stealth with performance. A special thanks to GX Compressors as well for their robust and efficient compressors that are an absolute game changer in the pneumatic technology and convenience. Be sure to check out Scout Air Guns for the Epic and the all-new Evo. JSB and Predator International for the finest in air gun projectiles. Affordable, well-made, and fun air gun products from Umarex Air Guns. And lastly, we express our sincere appreciation for Sabre Tactical. Their tactical gear is not only about strength and durability, it's about taking your air gun experience to the next level. We proudly stand alongside these titans of the air gun industry and invite you, our valued listeners, to explore their outstanding offerings. Supporting our sponsors is directly supporting the air gun geeks, enabling us to continue delivering you the content you love and trust. Thank you for being the most essential part of our journey. Your engagement and support make all of this possible. Until next time, stay tuned and keep supporting those who make the Air Gun Geeks a reality. Well, howdy, Bill. How are you? Patrick, I'm doing pretty well. I had uh, I had a, a rather uh, interesting field target um, experience this past weekend. And uh, I know you and I talked about it um, on the last podcast, kind of I was toying with the idea of what I was going to do there. And uh, I, you know, the Saturday, of course, you know, I, I had a ton of things to do and didn't get to um, dial the gun in that I wanted to bring. I didn't get to do a lot of things that I wanted to do. Um, and I, I said, well, you know, Saturday, uh, I will, I will mow the range, right? Because it hasn't been done. Oh, and man. yeah, you can imagine <laughs> with all the rain we had out here in California, um, uh, an interesting phenomenon happens in California when, when uh, the slightest bit of water hits our grass, it, it shoots up like bamboo and, Jeez. and it's ridiculous. And with all the rain we had this winter, um, my range was uh, a little bit, well, about mid thigh. <laughs> wow. uh, yeah. And there was no way I was going to do field target practice with that much, uh, with that much brush in the way. So I got all that cut down, but by the time I did, man, there wasn't a whole lot of me left in the tank, uh, to, to build another gun and, and start from scratch. It just wasn't enough time. So. I grabbed our old friend uh, Broomhilda mm. off the rack. I, I really, she had sat in the case for a year um, that I have, I have not shot that gun. And I, I was at a point with her development where that gun didn't shoot as well as my RWS. So that's what created the idea of building the RWS into a, a proper competitive gun. But anyway, I mean, there's nothing wrong with the HW97K. It's it's a great gun. It really does shoot well. If I do my job, it's it's pretty reliable. Um, but I I found that I I really didn't like um, the Element Helix for field target. I have tried so hard to make that work, mm -hmm. and I just I found that. Um, I would get really inconsistent uh, range information off that parallax wheel. And that's, that's, you know, if you're going to do well in field target, getting that data right is, is, you know, important for me. Oh, yeah. So I, uh, I threw a different scope on there and I, I didn't bother to get, uh, it was an Athos. Um, and I, I didn't, 
I didn't get a dope on it. <laughs> so the, the only dope I went to this tar this uh, field target match with was the one behind the scope. Um, <laughs> that was, that was the only dope I had. And it, it was, um, you know, I, I thought, well, I, I'm the only reason I'm going to this match is because it's the Jim Siren Memorial, uh, Sac Valley, uh, mm -hmm. shoot. And, you know, Jim passed away rather unexpectedly. And, and he was actually the guy who got me into field target. He was the one that said, you just come and shoot, you'll have fun. And yeah, I did, yeah. I did enjoy it. And, uh, you know, I was there for his memory, but I'll be damned, Pat, if I didn't walk away with second place. <laughs> second. Well, you, you know, like we always say, it's the shooter, not necessarily the gun. Well, it wasn't the shooter at all because I, <laughs> I think I got second place with the lowest score in the history of field target uh, for a second place finish. And the, I only, I only slightly sucked less than the guy who got third place. Uh, <laughs> he had, he had 19 points. I had 22. Um, and the, cause I was, you know, I was watching over the shoulder of the match director as he was doing the scoring and I was at the top. I'm like, there's no way with that performance that I, and I'm in first place. It's just ridiculous. And it wasn't until he got the last scorecard that he had one more a score that was above me uh, by quite a large margin, by the way. And, uh, and I'm like, well, you know what? Second place on the podium is second place on the podium. I'm going to take this and, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm going to, I'm going to dance all the way home, which, Turned out to be an absolutely horrific commute back from that meet because they had closed down one of the major arteries through the Bay Area. Ooh. Yeah, which which took away five lanes of freeway and pushed it all over onto another set of roadways. And that just, you know, you can imagine what that was like. So uh, I spent um, I spent almost three hours getting to that match. I spent five and a half hours getting home from it. Oh my God. That's yeah. I, I, I got home and I was just like, man, I don't, um, I don't, I don't go to the, uh, to the matches out there very often because that drive can be, it can be terrible. It can be, you know, quite pleasant, but um, this one was on the, on the sucky side. But mm -hmm. um, anyway, I'm glad I went, I'm glad I went out there. I'm glad I got to shoot. Um, to uh to jim's memory and jim was jim was a hoot to to go to a field target match with because he always had his dog sarge mm -hmm. with old old dog old man and you know the two of them were inseparable and sarge would actually go from lane to lane with jim as he shot <laughs> and jim had this really peculiar habit of putting every pellet head to his mouth before he loaded it in the gun. And I, I've never gotten the story why he did that. But every time it was part of his mantra, his pre-shot process that he would always follow. And you could, you could predict the weather by it. He would just grab that pellet, touch it to his mm -hmm. mouth, and put it in the gun. I'm like, what in the hell is that guy doing? I, I, I'm sure somebody knows, but I don't. But mm -hmm. uh, how were how would you what were you up to this week? What was going on in uh, in the land of uh, of iguanas and? Uh... Well, Bonnie and I decided we should leave the land of iguanas and in Florida sun and go to different sun. Mm. So we went to Vegas for uh, four days, which ended up turning into five because they canceled our flight. So oh my god! It, but uh, but that was a blessing because, uh, well, that's when, she, you know, we have a little competition. Who's going to win the most money with a little bit of gambling we do. And Pat, you should, have, you should have known not to book your flight on Zimbabwe mm -hmm. Airlines. I mean, that should well, have been a big, a big tip for you. I, I tried, but hey, whatever. It was a good time. We went and checked out uh, the uh, couple shows. Rock. The vault was a blast over there. Uh, it was it was a gun. It was fun watching all the boomers dance like they were teenagers again. You know, <laughs> it was a good time. I guess it's the number one show for the past ten years in Vegas. So, oh wow. Then we did a variety show, some gambling, some food, some walking around, just enjoying things, and then uh, came back home. 
and uh, started chasing iguanas again and getting ready for um, it's it's a speed competition, but it's precision speed. It's going to be in St. Augustine um, with a new guy, Greg. Uh, probably going to get him on the podcast. This guy's got some some cool bridging between the firearm side and the air gun side. But um, basically, it's a know your limits target type situation, and you only get ten shots, and you have two minutes to do it. Hmm. So it's a brand new setup. He's got a range that he built up in St. Augustine on his property, so that's exciting. Another place to go shoot. And then they're having a really cool get together afterwards, which is also unique. So I guess they're doing a pig roast. So I'm getting ready for that. Uh, learning the day state red wolf that I got and how to program it and all that fun stuff. So, you know, enjoying life. It's starting to get really, really hot but and humid, but uh, it is what it is. The iguanas are coming out, so Bob and Helen like it. So Very nice. Other than that, everything's real good. I can't complain. Things are doing well. Bonnie's doing well, so, you know. Cool. I hope, I hope you had a great vacation. We've got a, uh, we've got a guest uh, for this mm -hmm. episode that uh, really needs no introduction. Um, he is the, the transposed Wisconsin air gunner. Mm -hmm. Uh, he, uh, he went down to, uh, to engage with the one and only Donnie from Donnie FL mm -hmm. and, and help him out. And, uh, and I think that is amazing. It's an amazing, uh, synergy in our air gun world that, you know, those two guys can get together and make, make magic happen. But, in this episode, we're going to get a, a rare glimpse of what goes on behind the scenes mm -hmm. of not, not only creating a brand new air gun company, but also introducing several ground up new models into, into the air gun space. And as if that wasn't enough, Sweep the triple crown of bench rest, which is the pinnacle of, of air gun competition currently, uh, last year with their prototypes. That I mean, imagine all of that happening uh, at the same time. So we we were able to get PJ to come and talk to us about, you know, some of that drama and, and what has gone on. So. Um, let's go ahead and bring PJ in, Pat, and let him out of the naughty box. All right. I'll, uh, I got to remove the lock and open the door. Yep. And yep. There, there he is, he is. PJ, Unleashed. Unleashed. <laughs> hey, everybody. Thanks for having me on, gentlemen. I appreciate it. No, no Great problem. Here. You are always welcome here on the Air Gun Geeks, PJ. Uh, you, you, have you. A, uh, you have an honorary membership here. Awesome. So PJ, um, you know, what, what is going on down there in Florida that has um, really turned the air gun industry on its ear? I mean, you, yeah. uh, I mean, you, you went to the East Coast competition uh, a few weeks ago, and um, I didn't see any uh, podiums for the Red Panda, but... Um, so two second place finishes a second place in sportsman okay um, one of our saber tactical teammates um who is part of our team may i may circle back to that just for a second just because i think there's an opportunity to address a few mm -hmm. things um but he took second in sportsman and mm -hmm. then um thane took second in 100 yard bench rest oh okay with so, his, with his so you guys were right up in there you were right up in there but you know, I guess my point was it was um, it was a big, to me, a big wake up call for for the air gun industry when a brand new gun comes out and and says, "Ha ha, guys! I you know here, hold my beer. I got this." <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it, it it was fun to watch. Honestly, as a as an mm -hmm. observer, it was it was very interesting. So it, it was. It was really cool to have a ringside seat for it. Um, very, very, very impressive to watch what um, quality equipment and 
almost an eccentric level of preparation um, will will do when somebody is singularly focused on a on a goal and, and really what's what's possible um, when those things kind of mesh mesh together. Um, and I, I don't want to take anything away in this discussion because you know we start talking about NAC. Um, I don't want to I don't want to take anything away from Bill Squillis who who won mm -hmm. uh, NAC in the hundred yard. Also a member of our Saber Tactical shooting team, um, shooting his <laughs> FX Panthera, um, shot a fantastic finals card, um, and uh, you know won won the the whole event as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. uh, did a great job. So um, as far as our team was concerned, um, we had a great had, had a great time. It was a, a, a really well run event. Um, not perfect, um, but the fact that the people who ran it are open to feedback and you know have listened uh to the things that that were said and i think we'll have a better event as a result of that next year um, if you didn't i've been saying this to everybody who wants to listen if you didn't go this year and you're like man i should have you're right you should have because it's it's a really a cool place to shoot and a, a really good event um and so hopefully we'll see a lot more folks next year um i took fifth um, so congratulations, high, by the way, yeah, that's finish, cool. uh, in a pro final. So I was pretty, not as happy as one might be if maybe two or three pellets would have done something different than, <laughs> than what they did, uh, in that finals round. But that, you know, once they're, it, it's kind of like your kids, once they're out the door and on their way, they're sort of doing their thing and you, you might want to call back to them once in a while, but, uh, but they're doing their thing. Mm -hmm. Um, it was a, it was a really competitive finals and um you know between thane and i he shot the better card we were sitting right next to one another so essentially as as much the same wind um as you could have and um i, I felt i was happy with how i shot he, he shot well um so now we're now we're rolling out production models um, and actually thane's second place finish was with a production gun um and and maybe maybe that's the the place to start the story, uh, talking about sure, the difference good. between yeah, like yeah. prototype and production rifles. Absolutely. Uh, it, it seems like no matter when you start a project, uh, and this this project goes back like, you know, I think Thane showing up and winning Armac, it, it seems like oh my God, here's this what is happening, you know, how could this happen? How, how could somebody win with a new gun that nobody's ever, ever seen or heard of before? Um, you know, that doesn't mean that like this project started last May. Um, you know, the, the actual manufacturer of this gun was working on technologies like literally, you know, years before, um, and, and had a desire to bring a gun to market and just didn't have an outlet for it. Mm -hmm. um, so you have that kind of background technological market. And then, um, you know, in part, Donnie was connected to that individual or, or that company. And, you know, this conversation starts around, well, would you, would you want to bring forward to market something and, you know, Donnie and Thane uh, Simmons are very good friends. So, hey, Thane, if you were going to bring a gun to market, what features would you be looking for? And and you see this, this is before I was working full time with Donnie, you know, long before that. So I was getting little snippets of, hey, this is what's coming. This is what's you know happening. This is what you'd be involved in, um, you know, if you come down here to work with us. And, um, you know, but I would see these little snippets of, of things happening and, and testing results and designs. And, you know, as, as long as a project goes, it always seems that there's a rush at the end when, when something happens. Mm -hmm. So I moved down here about two weeks before RMAC last year mm -hmm. and get handed 
a gun. Here it is. They just showed up. <laughs> um, and, you know, we went to our Mac and I, I shot it and was immediately wowed by it. I mean, I, I, I had a competition gun set ready to go that I had kept separate from the, you know, the truck I loaded up and moved everything down, you know, in all that packing, here's the competition gun. It doesn't get thrown in with the rest of the stuff. It gets, you know, it gets special treatment and, and here's how it's going to get down to, to Florida. So it doesn't get, and, um, I was like, okay, well, the scope's coming off that and we're going to get this gun tuned and we're going to get it ready to go. And yeah, I, that, that gun's right over there. Um, I, you know, still have it, um, and shot it, you know, two weeks ago or three, whatever, however many weeks ago knack was, I shot it there. <laughs> nice. Um, but the, there's always this rush. So if you look at, you know, what's the difference of the, between the competition gun or the production gun that we're looking at now and the prototypes, there's things like the hardening of trigger sears. That should be a build. You know more about steel than, than I'll, you've forgotten more about metal than I'll ever know. You'd, you'd agree probably that that's a part that would get hardened. Yes. So those prototypes, there were little parts like that, that just didn't, that didn't happen. Hmm. Uh, and, and it wasn't that the manufacturer is sloppy or, you know, is doing a poor job. It's, we told them, look, we have to have this before our Mac. You gotta get this over to us because we want to be able to shoot it there. Um, if you look at the regulator between the prototype and the production, um, the production regulator is physically larger. Um, it's got on all the faces, more surface area. Um, I think it's a little more efficient. Um, it, it, I think it's capable of moving more air a little more quickly. Um, I, I think it's measurably better. Um, at NAC, the night before the finals, um, Thane was doing some testing, getting it, you know, doing his thing, getting his gun ready. And he's like, this regulator is not working right. She just gave up the night before. Oh, my God. But, like, you know, it's like, like one of those sappy movies, you know, where, where like you just, uh, I just can't go. And, uh, you know, but between cards, if you, keep the, you know, keep the, all, the, I mean, within the rules, you can, you can have a backup gun. So the night before he was up late getting a, a production gun tuned. Um, cause that's what we had. We had an extra production gun at that point. Um, so he shot his second place finals card with a gun. He had never done a practice round with. Oh, um, oh my God. And, and you know, there are, there are things about the trigger design that when we got the prototypes, and this is part of the process. You know, you get a prototype and you say, mm -hmm. all right, well, we like this, but we want this to be different. This is good, but let's change this, you know? So there are some things about, you know, how the rails are made, the balance of feel, all that stuff, and, and important things like the trigger and how the safety works and stuff like that, um, that are updated, in my opinion, upgraded because now they're production. So things like hardening ha has been done and been done properly. Um, so, you know, that, that second place card was shot with a rifle that he'd never shot a practice card with. Um, cause he anticipated his, you know, his gun would keep going. And that was just, right. now if we had a, if we had a full access to a machine shop where we could have rebuilt a piston, you know, all the O-rings you need, but you're standing in an Airbnb, you know I mean? Like how much, oh. You, you can only foresee so much. You can only bring, fly, ship so much stuff, you know, either across the country, south to north, or, you know, things from Utah, so west to east. You can only bring so much with you um, to maintain that. And if it, mm -hmm. you know, if it goes out on you, it goes out on you, and, and you have to be ready to switch to, to plan B. So um, one of the things I've learned about, thing as a shooter is the courage he has 
about his shooting. Um, you know, I've seen him, you know, you get 30 minutes to shoot these competitions. I've seen him get to a bench in the finals, decide he doesn't like the tune, retune, <laughs> and win. Uh, um, you know, I, who has, how many people have the courage to do something like that? Right. I heard you guys talking in the beginning, you know, you, you hear you're going to go out there and, you, hey, congratulations on the second place finish, by the way. I don't oh, care what you. the scores were. Congratulations on, <laughs> on finishing uh, second. But you, you, you know, you get there and things aren't right. And how many of us would have the, how many of us wouldn't just get frustrated? How many of us would have the courage to just say, mm -hmm. All right. Well, I'm doing this in about ten hours. Let's, uh, yeah, let's go. Let's tune in the basement of an Airbnb. You know, I'm out at Home Depot buying a a, a plastic tote and bags of rubber mulch, <laughs> so, <laughs> so we can we can get a chrono running and set up a, a pellet trap, so we're not so we're not damaging anything on Airbnb. We didn't have a range we could go to. He gets he gets there early in the morning. Can I have fifty yards? I need. A, I, I just put the scope on. Can I get a fifty yard zero? They helped us out. Um, you know, they were they were willing to accommodate a couple of shots. He's he's zeroed at fifty. Okay, I know where I'm going from here, and he goes out and shoots second place. So, uh, not to take anything away from Billy, he shot a great contest. Yeah. Uh, but you know, I've seen online a couple of oh well, he only took second. It's like well, you mm. know, there are some there are some other other. It things. sounds like he earned second. Yeah. 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 And that would have that would have put a lot of people in tenth. Yeah, and and here he comes away with the. You have some like, people who would walk away from a spot at a bench. I think. Yep. Um, yeah. So I, I, I'm, I am, I, I've traveled now with him to a couple of competitions, and I'm always consistently impressed with how he handles himself, uh, and and how he goes about the work of doing consistently well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm. I'm ecstatic that I made the finals at Pyramid Air Cup and the finals at NAC. Um, mm -hmm. Like to me, making the finals a couple times in the row is like wow. <laughs> and, <laughs> and you know, for him to for him to be consistently near the top is is impressive to me. So, um, yeah. but those are those are as you guys kind of wanted to hear about. Those are some of the the challenges because it's it seems like. Anytime there's a deadline, um, and maybe it's just human nature, but it seems like there's a rush um, up to that deadline. You know, we would have loved to have production guns in the country ready to ship to customers before an act. That just that that turned out to not be a, a, a real goal. Um, we had hoped to see the production rifles in December, early January, um, and you know, for reasons they weren't ready. And so you have to make a decision. Do we push something out that's not ready or do we wait till it's right? And yeah. um, I think the right play is to wait till it's right. I mean, there's, there's some things I guess you can rush and there's some you certainly can't. Um, we were, you know, we went live with the, um, you know, hey, you can order them last week and uh, you know today i was getting customer guns ready um, i would have loved to have been able to do that like last tuesday wednesday <laughs> so that last thursday when we were like hey it's live um you know we'd, we'd be ready to go it's taken us a couple days just to just to make sure things are are right for people so, you know, and, and that's what it's about. It, it's it's setting that quality, that level that Karma Air Guns wants to have and that Donnie and Thane are known for just as a brand. Mm -hmm. I'd sooner wait and make sure it's good. So when I get it, I'm excited and I yeah. can go shoot instead of getting it and going, ah, PJ, this is this yeah. isn't working or whatever. I would sooner wait. So, you know, that's that's a big thing that. I personally, you know, I would love to have one, you know, but I was like, eh, I'll, I'll, I'll sit back and let everyone else have one because it's a fascinating gun. And yeah. the backstory 
is really the big thing that Bill and I like to bring out. That road traveled from my perspective because I was in the Saber House last year at Armac. Impressive. I was just like, I, I'm amongst royalty, precision, <laughs> just procedure, and still having fun. Yep. You know, and when he gets to the bench and and all of that, you know, you don't just show up and do what Pat does and just start lobbing pellets. I did really good personally, but I was not a finalist. And watching him tune, a lot of people, they don't see that. Yep. And I'm like, you're changing? He goes, oh, yeah, I don't like it. It's going to, I'm like, it's not easy mentally. Thane is, I, I don't know how he does it. He's rock well, solid. I, I think he gets it because he spent so much time in that mode mm. on the bench before the event. He didn't he didn't dial a gun in and then throw it in a case and go to the event. That guy was probably shooting for a few hours a day um, for months leading up to that and going through that whole tune it, put it out there, tune it, put it out there, that whole exercise over and over and over again. I can just see him do it in my head. Um, you know, he and I got to talk at Iwa and it was, that was such a fun interview to do with him. And, you know, I, he, he strikes me as somebody who gets a you know, borderline maniacal uh, when it comes to uh, really wrapping his arms around the, the mechanical nuance of that gun and understanding it to a level that most of us rarely get to. Mm -hmm. and, and when you, when you walk into that bench in that event with that kind of, um, confidence it, it really isn't bravado it's just he's he's been on that road he, he knows he knows that road and it's really not that big of an impasse for him but we're looking at him like are you freaking nuts what, what are you doing and he's like no no relax child i got this um yeah. it's okay um, yeah, and the the preparation is uh, and I, it's not for me to divulge his secrets um, but oh, come on, DJ, that's you know, why every, we made you to wear <laughs> every, <laughs> every part of that process from making sure the, the air gun is set up, um, to knowing what's happening with his optics, um, to the, the very careful way he chooses which pellets are going to be, um, for, you know, ciders or any kind of tuning he wants to do. And then which ones are going to be shot in competition. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he, he's, he's an interesting, he's an interesting blend of, I am here having a good time. And, and this is, this is as much fun as, I mean, he's having as much fun as anybody's having um, at, at a competition. Um, but he's also, there to get some work done and um, clearly very serious about what he's doing. He right. is truly an air gun geek. Yeah. Let's, let's just like, I'm sitting here. He's probably thinking about the path of the air become the air gun. Right. Oh yeah. And he's, I, you know, but mm -hmm. his, there's obviously, you know, an apple not rolling far from the tree because if you've, if you've <laughs> bow, um, mm -hmm. You know, he, he's even, I mean, there, there are some things where you see Val's mind working um, and things like, well, I'm not really concerned with that at this point. Um, and, and Val is locked in on something, but usually it seems like that kind of comes around and, and then it's like, oh, you know, like I know Val's been tinkering with wind flag stuff um, and, and working on product development and, you know, okay, well, could this could this work? Could it work for me? Is it a saleable product? Uh, you know, they're the, the saber tactical side of, of, you know, they're, they're that other half of that company. Um, they're always tinkering with something. There's all, every time you get together with them, there's always something new. Um, and it's, it's like almost like Christmas morning, <laughs> you know, when they show up and they're, they're opening boxes and suitcases and it's like, Oh, wow. I've never seen that. Never thought about that. You know, like, 
those are the those are the kinds of things that are that are happening that are the the brainchild of that father son um, duo. And of course, there's more people at their shop. It's not not just Dana Val. They've got they've got really smart people um, who are helping them come up with stuff as well. But it's it, it is impressive to have an opportunity to see that firsthand. Um, and, and again, you know, how do you win three majors in one year? Um, you know, you have to have good equipment. You have to, you know, sort of be one with it. Um, you have to have the courage to, well, maybe the alertness to recognize some sort of change or something that needs to be changed, the courage to actually make that change. And then, um, you know, there's some skill involved in, in being able to figure out when is the right time to pull that trigger, you mm-hmm. know, cause it, a lot of hundred yard bench rest comes down to who's surfing the wind better. Um, mm-hmm. and you know, there's certainly, I, I, I hear some people and I, I guess because I, cause I shoot bench rest, I, I don't like hearing that, you know, oh, it's all luck and bench, you know, what bench you get and, you know, who gets the better wind or whatever. Um, I think certainly you can get unlucky and either miss a read, which really isn't unlucky, or what I know has happened to me from time to time where I have fired that air gun prior to the change being knowable to me. You know, you... Mm -hmm. you, think you have the wind red right you pull the trigger and see the change as the pellets in route to the target and you know what what would have been a nine is now a seven and you know that happens twice and you know you're not in the top three anymore and maybe if it's if it's early enough in the competition you're not going to the finals i mean that's that's the reality of it so I mean, I don't, I don't know that I buy the argument that it's all luck. Uh, I definitely think people get unlucky and that's, that's a challenge for them, but it's, you know, that's part of that is that mental game. That's part of it too. Um, you know, when you travel with somebody to competition and you're going back and forth from the hotel or the Airbnb and, you know, you're driving, they're driving, um, you, you learn some things about a person um, that you might not learn about in other situations. Uh, and again, um, Thane's just a really positive, positive guy. So I'm not surprised at all when something happens to him on the bench and his attitude is oriented towards how do I make the most out of this? Uh, he's not a guy who's going to get thrown off his game because, you know, something dropped into a six. Mm-hmm. Like there are some of us who that would just wreck our, well, okay, screw it. I'm not, you know, and, and now you, now your mistakes compound one another. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember driving in his Jeep around Utah and, you know, people cutting us off on the highway and stuff like that. And he's, oh, friend, no problem. There's plenty of space in there. You know, he just doesn't, he just doesn't <laughs> get angry about, about stuff. He just, you know, it, it, he, he's he un- unflappable. Stuff. Yeah, it's water off the back. So, so you know, he, he really is set up to do well in events where part of it is the mental game. Um, and then you go out, like, hunting with him and, y- you know, hey, there's a pigeon. And before you can get a sight picture on it, he's already shot it. <laughs> you know, it's like, can, can, can I have one? <laughs> can I have the next one, please? You know, like, you know, put your hand up if you, if you want to shoot. Yeah. He's, he makes those de- he makes decisions really fast. He you know he he knows his equipment. He's able to figure out what the yardage is. What and, and you know sometimes he dials and I've seen him hold. Um, but but he is he is a natural at a lot of these things, and so I'm just not surprised when he does really well. And every time I'm with him, um, I do my best to try and learn something from him because mm-hmm. uh, I feel well, like it having looks like association. Did, I, mean... I feel like I feel like I'm getting. I mean, better. One of the big things for me in this competition, um, it was my second 
card, which was the best card I shot of the entire event. It was the last, and the way I shoot, it was the top target on the fourth row from the left. So I shot the, th the fourth target, right? Second one from the top. And I felt the wind change. Okay, let's go back to the ciders. Waited a minute. Seemed to, to get back to what I was had been working with. Took the shot. Cider was good. Went up to the top. Wind changed again. Okay, let's go back down. Took a shot. No, that wasn't my wind. Took another shot. Yeah, that was pretty good. Took another shot. Yep, that's my wind. Went up, felt the change, stopped. Looked at my gun. All right, it's time to reload some magazines. Time to get some more air. Right, so load magazine, fill the gun up, go back. Cider, yep, that looks pretty good. Cider, yep, that looks pretty good. Went up to the top. Wind changed, felt it on my face, knew it was a different wind, didn't take the shot. I will tell you guys, last year, I would have said, I don't like this target. And, and mentally, I would have convinced myself that I could just power through. And I would have oh. taken a shot, and it would have been a six. Because mm. the, the winds at NAC, um, they were not super strong. You, know, we weren't, you guys have been at RMAC when, like, you know, like mm -hmm. the target backers are spinning off like they're tumbleweeds going across the, you know, gale. And the, and the, and the taco trailers blowing across the range. Right, yeah, right, yeah. right. Spilling ground beef everywhere. Everywhere. But it was a quartering headwind that would shift. Mm -hmm. So you, you could get caught holding on one side and it could suddenly push to the other side. You know, it was like that nightmare. Like, I hate that wind. Yep. There's just mm -hmm. no good answer for that wind, right? Uh, so it was, it, was, it was not like gale force. It was challenging because you really had to be patient. And, and I, know, I know myself well enough to know that in the past, I get to a point, whether it's I'm bored of this target or I'm frustrated, but I will convince myself. And, and I look back on it and I'm like, why did you do that? That was just stupid. Patience. Like you're not, you know, I'm, I'm probably a first 15 minutes guy, not a, you know, I, I don't need a half hour to shoot 25 shots. Right. I don't, I don't pound my ciders into oblivion. Um, I went through a whole magazine and had to change magazines and, <laughs> and was on the verge of rearing my gun before I shot that target. And man, am I glad I did because it, I, I I did it right. I, I don't remember if it was a nine or a ten, but it was a it was a good it was a good hit. And then I went on to have a great last column, and and shot the best competition card I've I've shot. You know, it was it was great. And and on the back of that, I was the top score going into the finals. For you know, it doesn't matter but it was cool to be in that position. Oh, hell yeah. Hell yeah. Uh, but it's that, that, that's the mental game is, is being able to recognize where, you know what, my tendency is to try, like I can fight this somehow. I can, you know, if I just want it bad enough, I can somehow master the wind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, unfortunately every once in a while, when you do that, you get lucky <laughs> And it works out, and then your brain. And you start to believe it, and that's yeah, you that's believe that, that that was see, it was destiny. I, I, there was no, there was no way I, you know, I'm Luke Skywalker. I, I can, you know, shoot across the, you know, Death Star and and hit, you know, camera buttons and closed doors and stuff like that. And no, you just keep getting lucky. Like, and then you wake up and you find out you're really a stormtrooper. You can't right, hit, right, can't hit anything. <laughs> so, so the, you know, the the lessons that I've learned through being able to watch uh, people who are definitely in this sport more accomplished than I am um, have paid off as far as I'm concerned. Now I have to continue to, to fight some of my tendencies and, mm -hmm. uh, and I know there's lots more to learn, but um, it's been a cool process and the, 
you know, the rifle that was today shipping out to people has a number of uh, improvements over what we were, you know, delivered this time last year um, as prototypes. And it's, it's because we took, we, we had, we had specific team meetings amongst the people who were shooting uh, the red Panda at Mac, um, at, um, pyramid air cup. And then, um, a little bit after extreme bench rest, um, to say, okay, what are really the critical things that, that we want to put forward, um, into a production rifle. Um, and that's, what's been delivered now. So, um, you know, again, like I said before, I'd love to have had this last week <laughs> to, to, you know, have, have shipped earlier, but, um, we don't want to, we don't want to rush stuff. So, so what's going on now, um, if people are interested in this, um, we're doing internal quality control checks, um, as happens when you're talking to a manufacturer and saying, get this to us as fast as you can. Um, sometimes things come with, sometimes things come to you and what should be painted white is painted red and what should be painted red is painted <laughs> white. You have to, you have to take it out and switch it. Um, so there's, there's stuff like that, that we've been making sure is right before they go out to dealers and, and therefore customers and, and direct to customers. Um, I've been, uh, putting base tunes on rifles, um, the last two days. I won't say it's all I've done, but it's a significant chunk of what I've, uh, what I've been doing mm -hmm. is, is tuning rifles. So at least when they arrive at people's houses, they're, they're kind of at a, a baseline. Uh, now that's, you know, I can only tune for one pellet at the, at the place where these rifles, you know, these aren't generalist rifles. These are purpose built rifles. Um, and everybody's going to have their own favorites. And the first thing I'll tell you is you're going to need to tune the rifle for the pellet you want to shoot. Mm -hmm. And tuning, your elevation. Yeah. I'm Big tuning thing. them at like sea level, basically <laughs> in a humid environment, um, for, a 50 grain pellet and my target is in the nine thirties because, you know, in, in the testing we've done over the last year, um, that 50 grain or flies really well at that speed out of this barrel. Um, so that's, that's what we've been, um, or what I've been tuning to. Uh, but if somebody wants to fly 44s, okay, well, you're gonna have to, uh, you have to knock that down a little bit. And then while all that's going on, because we want people to have information, um, in between all these things, um, we've been filming tuning guide, um, and mm -hmm. you know, how do you adjust the trigger if you want to adjust the trigger? So Izzy was, was filming a, a tuning guy or not tuning, but a how to adjust the trigger video today. And then we've got somebody editing those videos so we can get all this stuff out. Cause I mean, I, I think, I think people understand and misunderstand how big Donnie FL is. Um, we're not that big, <laughs> there aren't, you know, it's not like we've got 25 people working <laughs> to, to do all kinds of stuff. You know, it's, there's a couple of us, um, and, and if anything, more emails are coming in cause more people have questions and more, the phone is ringing more. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, you know, we still have all this other stuff that that's going on. So, um, it's, it, it is challenging, uh, but I know that the end result um, where other people are going to get to know, you know, really how great this, this air gun is to shoot. Um, I, yeah, I think it's going to be worth it. Yeah. And, and, and people that are listening and watching, we'll have the link, but you go to Donnie FL on YouTube and you'll see the whole list of videos that people yeah. are talking about. We did, we did the, I think the first one was maybe like how to load the magazine, mm -hmm. you know, which, that seems really elementary. And I think sometimes we forget that, especially when somebody comes to the sport and it's new. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and this magazine is similar, but kind of different from, from some of the other ones out there. So, uh, you know, it's, it, it was a, it was a good, personally, it's daunting when the boss says, all right, so one of the first things we need is a tuning video uh, on a platform that 
the production guns, like hardly anybody's tuned them. You know, like we we haven't we haven't had mm-hmm. them long enough to do enough with them to to have like mm-hmm. here you go. This is new. It may be <laughs> somewhat different from what you've been working with for the last year. Put together a video so people know how to do it. It's kind of like can I can I have a day to, <laughs> to just go like you know. <laughs> Tune one up, tear it down. Tune one up, tear it down. Like do it a couple of times. You know, it's mm-hmm. like, well, we really want to get this info out there. It's like, okay, well, let's let's go. So, um, <laughs> but behind the scenes, uh, we filmed the whole tuning video, and I went to um, Brody, who's doing doing a lot of our video stuff now, and I said, yeah, that stuff we filmed yesterday, we're going to refilm that today, because I I didn't feel good about it. I didn't feel like I had really internalized, um, you know. I, you guys know, and I think appreciate. It. I've been involved in education for a long time. Um, I think you know when you're like, yeah, I was kind of walking, I was walking a little too far out the pier, and it wasn't really all that steady. And, and you know, people who are making an investment, you know, especially the early adopters who are going to make an investment in this rifle and 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 set the course for the future of how successful this brand is going to be, uh, they deserve better. Uh, mm-hmm. So, what's going to be published? I'm hopeful tomorrow. Uh, knock on wood a little bit on that um but what's what's going to be out there is actually number two um and there were probably six tunes that were done in between there and i, I feel a lot better about um about the process of uh, uh, the information that we're sharing with people um, so, so let me ask you this is only the red panda coming out or because i know there was other versions of Carmen? so what we have in this first shipment which again, you know, we we're pushing to get this to people for our Mac, right? Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, mm-hmm. if you're going to buy something like this, you're going to buy it because you want to shoot it in competition. Correct. Um, so what we told them to do first was 30 cal pellet rifles. Okay. And um, so that's that's what the 100, 100 rifles came in, 30 cal pellet rifles. Out of those... Um, there were only two that leaked. Easy oh. O-ring fixes. Mm-hmm. Um, color me impressed on that. I'd agree. That's, that, that's really just, good. like when I when they told me that I was like, "All right, well that's you know we got somebody on first base now." <laughs> that, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so probably late this month, early next month. We have, I think the number is 500 rifles coming, and that will be an assortment of pellet in different caliber and slug rifles in different caliber. The slug rifles are set up with a barrel profile that is more suited to PRS. Mm -hmm. Uh, At NAC, I ran a PRS stage. Um, PRS is not my thing. I mean, I I think it's cool for people who like it. I'm not anti-PRS. I'm just not my style of shooting. Um, but I really noticed what a disadvantage anybody who has a tall rifle, you, you know, like a tall rifle with a hamster and a nice high scope kind of works for field target mm-hmm. because you don't have to wedge it between a bar mm-hmm. and the bottom of a yep. tire or something like that, you know, between slats of a ladder or something like that. So, um, I, 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 get that design uh, choice a little bit more. So it, it foregoes the big front tank for a double back tank. Um, so kind of the stock build for the slugs is a PRS look and a stock build for pellets is a bench look. So the longer front tank, top and bottom rails. Um, do you want to see one? Yes. Sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I apologize to the people who are listening to the podcast. Uh, maybe you want to jump over to YouTube and check this out. Oh man! Well, folks, I can tell you it is uh, it is a beautiful looking piece of of technology. It uh, it really does stand out. So the PRS version will have another tank here, mm-hmm. um, and a bag rider down here, and then. This front uh, tank will be gone um, in favor of a barricade stop um, and this ARCA rail being shifted up. 
Now, what's you, the weight of that gun that you're holding, the bench one? 17 pounds on scoped. Wow. That's okay. Pat's favorite. He loves really heavy guns. He yes. always, always says, you know what? This gun is just way too light for me. I would like a heavier gun. Yeah. Um, Makes things not, easier shooting iguanas with. That never. Well, it definitely has, definitely has some stability to it. I don't know that I'd want to walk it around, but uh, mm -mm. from the bench, there's nothing I'd rather shoot. No. It, but what's nice is. about that is you don't have to add a lot of weight to it. No, and it's That's, got M lock galore. So if you want to, you certainly can. Yeah. Um, but you got Arca way out in front. So for, you know, from a bipod standpoint, you don't even have to kick the legs out if you don't if you don't want to, mm -hmm. uh, just because they're so far out. Um, it, it's really, it's really like great to shoot. And the more you shoot it, like you just feel like f feel like you're part of it. Um, one of the videos I've got to get probably early next week. I just discovered some things today, taking stuff apart and putting it back together. But the the buttstock um, has an up and down adjustment, a length of pull adjustment. And I, I just found out that if you pull the screws out of the back, it's actually, you know how like, uh, so uh, a, a like law enforcement holster will have different pivot points. Mm -hmm. So you can screw it on. You know, so it's like kind of so you forward or back. Yeah, 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 just depending on how your draw is. Yeah. The butt pad does that kind of radially. radially. Oh. So if you, if you want it kicked over a little bit because you want a little angle on your shoulder, it's got that adjustment too. Um, and I don't know. I'd have to count the holes. There could be 20 ways you can adjust. It's, it's like, you know, like the old uncle Mike's holsters had like three positions you could put it in, you know, mm -hmm. up and down, a little back, a little forward. Um, this has way more, way more adjustability than that. So another video to, to do so people can, <laughs> can get it, but you know, on a bench gun, uh, those things are, are important. You need that gun to, to set to your shoulder, no matter, you know, whether you're using like a monopod on the back or a squeeze bag or, mm -hmm. or just, you know, kind of freehand in it. Um, you knew that, but but you guys asked about stuff that's that's also coming. Um, this is the EQ. Oh, so this is our bullpup. Um, this is probably not available to anybody until um, I think the latest I saw was. August, September uh, is anticipated shipping. Um, and then we also have the SLS, which stands for side lever semi. So it's a combination side lever um, or with sort of the pull of a button, um, you can put it over into semi-automatic mode. Um, PJ, on the, because uh, I, I spent some time studying on the Karma website. Mm -hmm. And the the SLS seems to have a pretty narrow band of calibers that it's available on. Is that is that due to the tuning of that semi-auto function and the amount? Yeah, there's of only there's only so much you can do within the same design. Um, and ultimately, when you're working with, and this is this is another learning thing that's you know it's been on my list for the last last year now almost that i've been here um you know I, I think i always thought about like variety as kind of the spice of life and and why wouldn't we have more options um, it turns out when you are working with a dealer network you can really only offer so many different things but before you drive your dealers absolutely insane mm -hmm. um, so part of the decision is well how many different things can we really uh, can we really offer? And then um, if you're going to bring a gun to market, you have to be prepared to pay for all the guns you're going to bring to market before you can charge anybody for any of the guns that you would like to sell to them. Right. So at one point with the SLS, um, we were looking at two lengths in each of four calibers. Wow. So eight total guns, 
22, 25, um, 30 and 357 or 35 in a pellet, you know, as a pellet gun. Well, if you do each of those in a, a standard and a compact or call it standard and long or, you know, call it compact, standard, standard, long, depending on, you know, well, now, now to bring those guns to market, you have to pay for the development of eight different guns. Hmm. So, um, the decision is there is a compact which is available in 22 and 25 and then a standard which is 30 and 35. Um, oh. and part of the, the like smartness of, of ultimately that decision is it streamlines the manufacturing a little bit because there is sort of optimal passage size and optimal barrel length compared to valving. Um, you, you don't just, and this is true of like pellet, slug, and air gun design. You, it, it turns out you can't just take a 22 and make it, you know, 5% bigger and look, it's a 25. Like, like things don't just, scale like that um mm -hmm. and really i think the companies that are doing it right are saying okay we are we are gonna make this and and this is maybe perfect right you have to, to pick us a, a spot somewhere right you could you could say 25 right right and we can take 25 and we can make it a 22 and we can make it a 30 can we go up to 35 can we go down to 177 and sometimes the answer is well if we change this spring right if we neck down this yes we can i think fx for example has done a really good job with that i remember the original crown you had that transfer port adjustment you know mm -hmm. so it kind of was caliber labeled and then you had hammer spring and, and you had regulator to you could really make a lot of mm -hmm. adjustments uh, right. out, of that, out of that gun um, I think some companies, and I don't, I don't know this to be a fact, but I, it is my guess, like Air Venturi has said, you know, the Avenge X is really good in 177, 22, and 25. It, it may not really scale all that well to 30. We're just not going to make it because mm -hmm. it doesn't, it doesn't work. That would be a whole different gun if you wanted to make that. And if that, if I'm right, because that's like I said, it's a guess. Nobody's told me anything. Um, I think they were smart to do it that way. Don't 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 stretch it. Um, in the EQ, the way it's designed, um, and I haven't seen like the schematics of it. Um, they've they've been able to to broaden the caliber range a little bit. So the one set that will be available in one seven seven. Um, and I'm excited about the 177. I mean, I'm excited about a lot of things, but I'm I'm actually really excited about the the EQ in 177 because it's it's compact, it's mm -hmm. like tank like durability, um, and I think you're going to be able to get some pretty good power out of that with a really quiet um, muzzle report, uh, which is perfect for backyard pest control. Now, what's the weight? I'm big on compact, lightweight guns. Um, I think it's in the eight pound range. Um, and I'm hoping there are a couple, I've been asked to give some feedback. It's just why it's sitting at my house right now. I just, just brought, okay. I brought it home so you guys could see it. So, and again, anybody who's listening to the podcast, mm -hmm. maybe Pat or, or Bill can <laughs> edit in a, like, go to the YouTube video, go to this point. So you can see the pictures, do the show and tell like everybody else who watched it on YouTube. Um, uh, but uh, I brought it because I knew you guys were going were gonna to want to see it. And I wanted to show it to you. Uh, but my job, aside from getting a lot of stuff on the red panda side ready, is to give feedback on the EQ so that those can be uh, that feedback can be incorporated into the production run. Mm -hmm. So that's um, and, and that's yeah. the process, right? You you get something and they're like, okay, here's here's our baby, and somebody's got to look at it and say this is ugly 
<laughs> Your baby's <laughs> ugly. We gotta fix it. To be changed, right? <laughs> and I, I would like this. I would like. I don't know how they're gonna do it. I would love for this Aragon to to lose a half pound. It's mm -hmm. super well balanced. Uh, now, interesting, Bill. This might be of interest to you. Um, we had this with us at NAC, and some of the guys that we're associated with while they're there at NAC shooting that kind of competition are super interested in field target. And immediately what they said was, oh, this would be really nice in 177 for field target because it's it's got that weight that makes it stable. So my mind's in the... Huh, you and I had that conversation. Do I know anybody week? at Saber Tactical who would be willing to like design a hamster around this air tank <laughs> like like you know the 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 beauty of some of the relationship uh, between these companies and the ownership and and who who knows who and who's friendly with who is that we can make cool products you know mm -hmm. one company can make cool products for another company um and, and ultimately it's the folks who are out there like us doing shooting in the evenings or weekends or during the day um who benefit from that because you, you wind up with with really cool stuff so um there's uh there's a lot to like about this stuff and and you know when i talk to donnie about things he consistently says well we want to get it right we don't we don't want to release something that's not not right and i see it in a practical day-to-day -day sense that it's way even though sometimes it causes a delay uh, or or makes more work internally. You're way better off getting it right, so that you don't have to have people shipping stuff back, you mm -hmm. know, in lots of cases across country, so you can fix something. We'd rather rather. Well, that snarls everything because then you got you've got um, you've got work to do the customer service side. Then right. you've got work to handle the product twice, mm -hmm. and and then you've got the image in the field of an unreliable product. So it's, it's bad all the way around. So I, I agree that that focus is, uh, is important, but I, I'm, I'm excited to try an EQ, uh, on my field target course here, uh, on my farm and, uh, and see what it can do. So I'm, I'm eagerly awaiting that development when it, when yeah, I, I, you know, I field target is not the thing I think about first. Um, I do think it's got a lot of application that way, though. I mean, I, I do think it it balances out nicely for that for that kind of shooting. And and if you're one of those people that likes a little a little weight um, to add to the stability, it's it's definitely it, it is definitely a robust feeling gun. Yeah. I think that's the one thing Pat and I disagree. Um, mm. Well, first, first of all, he's left-handed, mm. and uh, and I'm more correct, Wait, and I'm right-handed. I'm, I'm left-eye dominant. <laughs> I'm, pardon me for being blind. See that right there? Yep. That's so you can switch it. <sighs> yeah, I can't wait to play with one of them. Yeah. Yeah. I got to one is faster. <laughs> I actually, I, I like a little weight, uh, on my gun and I, you know, it's, I, I like springers. I mean, my springers are like 10, 11 pounds. They're yeah. not, they're not lightweight guns, but, uh, yeah, it, um, it's so interesting. I mean, I understand Pat, Pat has a purpose behind his, uh, not wanting the weight because he's walking around, he's stalking. He is the, he is the predator, uh, yeah. out, out on the prowl, um, and he's, you know, he's drawing down on those evil creatures that you guys have crawling all over yeah, the place. I think, I think when you're, when you're walking a half mile at a time carrying mm -hmm. it, you look at it differently versus holding it for two minutes and then putting it in a wagon to, to wheel it over to the next or a, a, a Bob Absolutely. As, you, as you so well design. Um, mm. I, I think you look at, I think you look at it different, just like, you know, if somebody if somebody was like, "Hey, you want to buy a seventeen pound gun?" I'd be like, "For what?" You know, well, but when you're bench rest shooting, it actually right. sure, um, absolutely you know, well, it's great. It's going to be over twenty when I put a scope on it. Like it's I, and it, like we always say, I think, "What's your purpose?" What's your purpose? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I think uh, I think we are trying uh, very hard to make sure that we're able to cover um, many of those, maybe not all, but many of those purposes and um, also uh, bring products out that are going to satisfy people at different price points. 
I mean, I don't know that we'll develop a $500 bench gun. Uh, you know, that, that's, mm -hmm. that's probably not our, that's probably not our niche in the market. Um, but you know, the, the red Panda is, um, not an inexpensive air gun, uh, retails, you know, like 2350 in the U S. Um, I, I, we have other stuff that will be considerably, uh, tiered down. Right. Exciting. So the uh, what is the uh, what is the price for the EQ going to be ballpark? I mean, uh, nine hundred. Yeah. Okay. Is what our projected retail is. And there's now, some. If anybody wants to look at KarmaAirGuns.com, there's some specs out there that are subject to change at this point. It's uh, obviously yeah, the manufacturer. Yeah. It's it's what they're getting and testing. Um, you know, as soon as as soon as we have real numbers that we generate. Um, you know, what you can do on a, a test range is, is a little different than what you can do out in the environmentals. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I, I have one question. If you could put on your uh, your all-seeing cap and get your crystal ball out, um, do you ever see, yeah, do you ever see uh, Karma producing a more traditional uh, wooden or synthetic stocked style rifle or are they all going to be more tactical uh, in their aesthetic um i think if we were to develop a partnership with someone whose specialty was working in wood um, i could see it happen But that's a relationship that I don't think exists yet. Not to say it wouldn't in the future, but. Um, so you, when you say that, you're looking for a um, basically an Asian version of a um, of a GRS or a. Um, um, I, I wouldn't Minelli, Minelli or, or one of those I, companies. Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't limit it to has nothing to do with point of origin. It simply has to do with uh, one of, one of Donnie's gifts. One of the things he's good at is developing relationships with people mm -hmm. um, and, and finding, finding individuals who um, can bring something unique to the, to the table and then you know, he's good at getting folks to, you know, he's good at finding people to work with. So, you know, who knows who that might be, but I think if, I think if he saw, Hey, we could do this and we could bring these things together and look at what the result would be I, that, like, that's not, that's not off the table. I just don't know that he's met that person yet. Right. I understand. Yeah. Makes sense. Good answer. And it, I mean, it, it could be, okay, this, this will show my ignorance on this. I don't know if, you know, when we talk about Manelli, I don't really know if that's like, is it Bob Manelli or like Stan Manelli? Like has Mr. Manelli passed low these many years ago? And there's a, but like, you know, uh, he could he could wind up at a table at, at Iwa some year, talking to somebody there, and like, hey, let's let's do a pro. You know, I've got this idea for a stock. Uh, this is how this is my view of how things happen. I've got this idea for something. I think you're the guy who could bring it forward. It's funny you say that because uh, I I had a conversation. I'm trying to remember if it was an Iwa or shot, but I was talking to Boyd's. Um, Boyd's makes a lot yep. of really cool yep. wooden mm -hmm. laminates and, and regular mm -hmm. stocks for the firearm world. Yep. And I, I was talking to the sales guy there and I'm like, you know, there's a whole nother world of stocks and people who love to spend money on on custom furniture for their air guns mm -hmm. 
And they're like, is there really a market for that? I'm like, are you kidding me? Yes, there's a, I believe there's a market for that. Um, and, you know, even, even uh, you know, if you don't want to get into dealing with the tooling for wood, but you want to invest in a mold and just make a synthetic, there's, there's lots of innovative synthetic designs that you could get away with that, uh, that could definitely be marketed to that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of times, you know, like, you look at a gun like the, the Nodos from Umarex, you know, it, it's simple, it's inexpensive, mm -hmm. it's cheap, but man, you make parts for that. And the Delta is that there's a hundred thousand of them out there. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, well, you, you know, we had this discussion quite a bit, you know, the, the focus that Sabre Tactical has been onto a couple, um, a couple different rifle families, most of which are, are fairly expensive. Um, anybody who's paying attention knows that, you know, this last year we released a chassis for the Avenge X. Um, and that, you know, that release isn't without risk, but it, it takes a certain mindset to understand that there are, there are people who will buy, you know, a, a rifle that's already in a GRS um, or Sabre tactical chassis, and they'll pay a premium price for it. And then they're quite comfortable doing it. It's not a problem. But then there's also a huge section of the air gun market who will buy a $69 pumper. And over the course of two years, they've got $1,200 invested in that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's worth $69, mm -hmm. but they've put 1200 into it and they're very proud of it. And absolutely mm -hmm. they should be. And whether that's because that's the, you know, they can only take such a big bite financially, and they have to take lots of little bites to get it done. Or I, I think there's two. I think there's two camps there. There's yeah. exactly the camp you just described, and there are the people who do it just for the joy of tinkering. Yep. Uh -huh. There's actually a third camp that involves how much money they can squirrel away at a time from significant others. Well, yeah. I mean, and how often a package can show up? If my <laughs> wife had any <laughs> idea money. what the contents of the safe to my right were actually worth. Um, she, yeah, <laughs> right. It right. wouldn't go well. It would right. not go well. But the, so, so there's, you in know, in fact, the, if anything the, ever happens to me, PJ, make sure you're here. Okay. Before she I'll, puts I'll, the prices. You let me know. I'll book the ticket. I'll book right. The ticket. <laughs> right. But that's, you know, we we built that chassis so that, um, you know, it can use the furniture from the Avenge X chassis version mm -hmm. um the avenge x chassis or tactical version sorry um it has a um buffer to an ar-15 like buffer tube but it's not threaded in it as an ar-15 buffer tube it has an ar-15 like grip but it's it's not actually really uh, attached like an ar-15 grip would be attached Right. But we built that so that you can reuse those parts so that when someone, you know, has this and buys this, the the cost of making that swap can be minimized because you can reuse parts. And mm -hmm. then when you decide, I want a different grip on it, you, know, you might like this grip, for example, okay? you, you can go out and buy... And for those of you who are listening, I just showed a random AR grip that happened to be sitting on my kitchen table, which is mostly because my wife's been out of town for last week. But <laughs> you, you can you can add that part a month, six months, a year later, yeah, and and you can spread out the cost of ownership over a, a longer period of time. And that was, uh, you know, we we felt that that was a good plan when we looked at. So who who is it? That's the the man or woman who's buying an Avenge X. It, it may be somebody who, you know, isn't going to, you know, there are some really cool chassis out there. Yeah. The, um, even it, there, the amount of money that some of those chassis costs is. Mm. And you, you got to, you got to, you got to play to that. You got to play to that crowd. That's just trying to fly below the radar on right. that credit card report every month. Mm -hmm. So that nothing sticks out and right. you know and and gets attention. And we love those people too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I I think the NGX is a great shooting rifle. I like shooting it. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. I like I it better. Agree, yeah. 
I like it better in our chassis. Um, I think it it adds some some structure to it. Um, we could have a whole episode where we argue the various merits of barrel bands and and detractions of barrel oh, yeah. bands and stuff like. I mean, that's a whole that's a whole topic all to itself. Um, but I think I think it makes it a I think it makes an improvement to an already good, if not great, rifle. Um, and I was, I think it was really cool that we were able to to bring that project all the way through. Yeah. So we were talking a little earlier uh, about making videos. Yeah. And I wanted to, I'll say do the tail end of the podcast. Bill, I mean, I haven't, I haven't done it. I'm going to be honest. So I'm going to be the, the, the third wheel here looking in from everyone else. What, what's all involved in that? Like last year, uh, two, I should say, yeah, not this year, but two, yeah, yeah, last year, PJ, you were running around and you were popping videos off. And I'm like, I'm talking a bit like, how the hell is he doing that? I, then, I I texted PJ and I said, have you got somebody editing for you that's running around scooping up your footage and then regurgitating it in the evening? Because how the hell are you doing that? And I tried to do that this year at, yeah. at shot. And I, you know, I was up every night until 11 30, 12 o'clock, you know, finally waiting for that upload on borrowed Wi-Fi. Yep. To get to get done, and then you know, get up at six o'clock in the morning and go do it all over again, and it's uh, it's, you know, I think a lot of people just think that we wander around Shot Show and 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 all of this magic happens, and then poof, there's a video, but the, it's not that simple, is it, PJ? No, and I think I think you have to. It, so I would not. I would not recommend trying to do it to somebody who hasn't got a little bit of uh, seat time, both in editing and and filming and understanding what's what's going to be interesting and relevant. Um, you know, it's it, it, if you take an event like Shot Show, it's probably going to be pretty tall. It's going to be a tall order to be like, I'm going to Shot Show for the first time, and I'm going to film all this stuff. Um, I, I think that's I think that's a pretty tall order because you know an event like Shot Show is so big. Um, you walk in and you're you feel drunk half the time just because you know you, you think you know guns and then you know there's 175 brands you've never even heard of. Um, but th there is there is no real secret to it. It's well I don't know uh, if if it if it's a secret I'll just tell it. Um, you have to make a plan. Um, and figure out ahead of time who you really want to try to talk to. Yeah. Um, you have to prioritize, you know, and I would just say pick, pick, you know, if it's a, if it's a three day event, um, you know, this is my important Friday, this is my important Saturday, and this is my important Sunday and, and everything else is going to play second to those. Um, because if you don't prioritize the ones you really want, and whether that's because you think it's going to get you the most views or because you um, personally have a, I want to do this. Um, if you don't prioritize them, you're going to, you're not, you're going to be busy doing other things and you're going to miss out on, mm -hmm. on those opportunities. And if that was what was important to you, or, you know, that's what somebody was paying you to do. If, if you're lucky enough to be in a situation yeah. where there's a little less, you know, some sponsorship or some money involved, um, then you kind of have an obligation and you really better be dialed into that. Um, you know, the, the couple of events where I've been really successful at generating content, um, I went in with a clear plan um, of what I was going to ask of the people I was going to ask questions of and not, it was not something I had like written down or scripted because I just generally don't do it that way. Um, but I knew the questions I was going to ask. My gear was ready to go. My gear this year for the British shooting show, it, I had, I have, I have now established like my kit um, and my go-to equipment that, that I like the way it works and it works for me. Um, and so that's, you know, the, the, the gear is set aside. My bag is set up. Yep. DJI, uh, pocket <laughs> three. Yep. 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's what I that's what I use as my primary camera on reviews. I I bought it the combo that comes with the the mic, and then for a hundred bucks you can buy a second mic, and so that's ready to go. Um, so I, I set my bag up so those are at the top of the bag all the time. So if I if I get an impromptu, y- you will you will not go at a trade show into a booth and have ten minutes to set up your gear. Not not. And I know I, I know I can't, well, I could offend you guys, but I would, I would never do it consciously. I know you won't be offended. There are, there are YouTubers who can monopolize a booth for an hour and I'm not those people. Mm -hmm. You can't spend, you're not going to get to spend 10 minutes in somebody's booth of all the people that they're trying to see. They're not, you know, they're not given Wisconsin air gunners. They're not getting target forged. They're not given air gun geeks. Um, they'll give us the time to have a meaningful conversation, but not to monopolize their booth space to set up equipment. Mm-hmm. Um, so you got to have, you, if you're doing this kind of stuff at trade shows, you got to be ready and fast with it. Um, yep. And you got to know that what they want to give out is information about what they're trying to show. So they're ready to tell you about the new stuff, you're going to have to, if there's like something that you've always wanted to ask, you got to work that in last. Um, yep. And once you get that, um, then you go back to your hotel and edit. Now, if you, if, if you're reasonably good at interviewing and you have a reasonably interesting interview subject, that edit shouldn't take you too long because no. like I, I shoot it in as much as possible one continuous roll. And so, you know, there's there's an intro and there's an out and it takes probably longer to make the thumbnails than it does. And again, that's something you can sort of have, you can help yourself out by doing some of that. You know, here's what my thumbnail is gonna look like. Here's where I'm gonna put my caption in. Mm-hmm. Uh, Canva is a great, you, know, you can get the free version oh. of Canva and that makes some really that good. Is- that is my go-to for for that. I, I I would be sunk without Canva, but you know Pat Pat played down his hand in covering these events, and I I do want to highlight his effort uh, for Iwa because um, he and I kind of divide and conquer when we looked at Iwa, and Pat took over the scheduling side of it, and he's yep. like, I'm gonna I'm going to arrange where you need to be and when, and because Ewa was a very different paradigm for me because I, I was working a booth for a company and I, I had to really argue hard to get some me time right. uh, at Ewa. And I'm like, you can't, you can't ask me to go to a show like Ewa and not let me off the chain for a little bit. I said, I need a day and a half of that show to myself. Um, and that was a, that was a tough negotiation. They did not want yeah. They did not want me to step away from that booth for a second. I, I get it. Um, but, you know, I, I really, I wanted to be out there in the, in that world. And Pat handled all of the scheduling and had me an agenda, which made it super efficient for me from a time standpoint. But I am sitting there for a week before the event, analyzing the maps and highlighting all of the places that, okay, I got to go there. I got to go here. I got to go there. And then mm-hmm. creating a, a kind of a flow for me before I get there, because these shows are massive. It's on a scale that most people rarely ever get to experience. I mean, I'd been to trade shows in the various industries that I worked for. None of them prepared me for SHOT Show. <laughs> the, the epic scale of that event it's like you if you did one building one hall uh you you would be exhausted by the end of the day and yeah they talk about like shot show if you start at the beginning and you walk to every booth <laughs> it's it's something like you get 4.8 minutes in every booth and then the show's over like if, yeah. if you were there from open to close, um, it is it is miles and miles of carpeted pathway. Some of them are carpeted, um, 
and even if you if you are over on the Caesars side and then have to go back to the Venetian, oh, it could be a half hour walk to get you know like and, and you you just it's it's a it's I think it takes your first day just to get your bearings on on where things are and. Uh, I think, you know, earlier, Bill, you were telling me, like, you know, you'd get there and you'd be ready at the right time, but then somebody else's meeting went long, so now somebody shows up late and, and that can back you up into something. I mean, you have to be, you have to have the mindset of, I, I'm going to, I've got these priorities. I I know, you know, here's the reality. If your second interview is the interview for the day, and it's a half hour into the the time that you've got allotted for the first person and you anticipate that's going to be a longer cut, you know, maybe it's only 10 minutes and you're still fine, but you may have to, you have to know when to fish or cut bait. Like you, you have to be willing mm-hmm. to, to yeah. walk away because you have to keep your eyes on that at, at the British shooting show. Um, my, I mean, I, I had Thane was there, so I had an opportunity to talk to him. Um, he was, he, he had brought the prototype of the King chassis for the FX King. So we were going to talk through features on that. Um, I had ample opportunity to do that uh, with him. So that, that like, I knew that was going to happen. I knew I was going to do it. We had a, a lull in the first day, so I took care of that. But beyond that, the, the one thing I really wanted to do was I wanted to go shoot a BSA rifle. I had never, I'd never seen a BSA rifle in the real world. Um, there are obviously loads of people who think they're amazing. Um, I got somebody who was willing to introduce me to the BSA people. Um, but I think I had to go down there four or five times. And fortunately, uh, the British shooting show geographically isn't that huge. It's mostly in one, one expo, uh, building. So not too hard to get around. Um, but you know, that was, that was the priority. And I made several trips down there until I was able to finally, and, and as it turned out, um, they were amazingly accommodating to, to what I wanted to do. Uh, they let me have the rifle that I wanted to shoot. They let me have, they cleared out a bench for me, um, and, and the bench next to it so I could put my camera stuff there. I mean, they were, they were super awesome. And I left there going, yeah, I hope I get to shoot one of these again. Cause uh, it was a really, uh, really great shooting, um, rifle, you know, it's the rifle everybody's been shooting all week. So it's, it's, you know, not like they cherry picked one. It was just, uh, it was the one that everybody'd been working on and it was, a uh, it was a really good experience, but you know, it took persistence and, and not giving up on it because, you know, you walk down there, Hey, is so-and-so available? No, he's in a meeting. Okay. We'll try back later. You know, mm-hmm. like how many times can you go back to that? But if you don't set those priorities for yourself, um, you're going to walk away feeling like you missed a, missed a shot. And a number of the times where I walked down there, I bumped into somebody else, um, where it was like, okay, I can get a couple of minutes uh, of their time. And wow. But, but the big thing is disciplining yourself because you go to these events and, you know, you get done and I'm usually traveling with a team of some sort. Um, you know, I was, I was there representing Sabre and Donnie FL. So, you know, we had dinner afterwards and then it's okay. I'm going to go back to the room and I could go to sleep or I could stay up for two hours and get, get some videos out. And, you know, I prioritize that for that week over sleep and, yeah, I slept when I got home. I slept on the plane <laughs> on, yeah. on the way back. But I do think I do think you do want to make a conscious effort, and I do this. Um, you know, I went to NAC, and I was there to shoot and support our Saber team. I I did a little bit of video. Um, I took some pictures, so I, I I did a lot of posting. I wrote about the event, uh, but I wasn't there to do a series of videos about the event that was a conscious decision i made weeks before the event yeah i i've had this conversation with patrick um you know when we go to these competitions 
uh, for me, if I'm going to be in competition, every bit of me has got to be focused on that. And, and for me to try and generate content while I'm there is, is I'm both are going to suck. I'm going to be mm -hmm. a crappy shooter and my content's going to suck. Right. So, you know, what am I there to do? I'm, I'm really there to capture the story. At least that's, that's what I feel my role is. So, right. you know, I, I tend to gravitate more towards that. I, and, you know, um, I'll, I'll go catch a field target match on a week that, you know, there isn't something big going on and that'll be mm -hmm. my, my enjoyment. But I, I love covering those events. I love gathering the stories from those events mm -hmm. and bringing those to our air gun brothers. I mean, that's, yeah. that brings joy to me. So, you know, why not, why not focus on that? And yeah. I, I, get, I get some grief sometimes from some of my, uh, my field target friends. They're like, why didn't you shoot the event? I'm like, you know, I, I was too busy BSing right. with people you're, and pressing something them. else. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, and due to the relationship, I like being immersed in a competition so that I can talk about it. Right. As yeah, I, I'm no Thane Simmons. I'm no Val. I'm just a guy that likes to shoot in a competition and have fun. Don't be last. And just just go at it, you know, you know, um, and just have fun with it. Like this year, I'm shooting a day state. I've never tinkered with one. I got a Red Wolf. Um, it's very different. Yeah. You know, and it's just like, okay, you know, this part of my journey as an air gunner has gone to electronics. Let's play with that a little bit. You know, because I've played with the springs and all that other stuff, and Bill and I talk about that. And uh, my my Air Max Catran, I still love that little one seven seven. You it's know, cool. making little transfer port reducers to go because that was a twenty five gun. And then they said, "Oh, we could do twenty two, and then yeah, we could do one seven seven, but efficiently." Talking to Chris from Air Max, I was like, well, "Let's do that," and then playing with that, and you know, I still have fun with that, but it's. I, I have the brain a little bit like thing. Like, how does that work? Why would I want an electronic gun? How does it feel? Is it truly a mouse click? Eh, you know, and then now the new one that's on the workbench looking over there is the new Karma guns. It's like, okay, well, how's that work? How's that shoot? You know, bench-wise, for me, as... You know, I, I consider myself just a normal air gunner. And then out in the field, shooting iguanas, mm -hmm. squirrels. What's this gun like, you know? And that's why we that's why I started the podcast three years ago now, almost three and a half years, is to cover the entry-level person. Well, the person that knows nothing, the entry-level, the hobbyist, then you got the veteran, and then there's the geek, which is where we're at we're like yeah we need to do this and you know tuning is not just a normal air gunner no i think the video, number of people who yeah. i think the number of people who actually actively tune air guns is is a, a pretty small minority of yeah uh, and to do a video and be able to talk about it i don't want to say you know the book for dummies but just to break it down to what well, you need to do this and try and get it here Nope. And explain it is is not not everyone can do that. So yeah. I give you props on the videos on those. Uh, well, I, I'd, I'd love to hear your feedback. Um, you know, when the when the Red Panda tuning guide, uh, it's it's interesting to work with uh, somebody else who is filming. And I'm used to doing my own. I'm used to being the mm -hmm. one man show, and it's interesting to have somebody else um, who is probably going to edit it differently than I would. Um, but, it, you know, just in terms of like, you know, my growth, um, I, it's great not to have to be the one who, who does everything. And as long as people now, now that, PJ is the talent, right. It, and it, it's every mm -hmm. once in a while relaxing to just be able to be the talent. <laughs> well, Bill and I are always here to give you uh, someone outside that circle. Well, I, I appreciate you that. Know, I appreciate that uh, a lot. 
that's one thing Bill does. And if I do something, we send it to each other. And then Bonnie looks at it also. And she's like, I don't know what you're talking about, which is that right. that person who doesn't know that new air gunner. And she's like, oh, now I now I know, you right. know, because that's that's what it's for, you know. Yeah. So and we enjoy doing it, you know. It's, a, it's like I'm I'm excited about all of this, you know. So well, well thank you guys any... for uh for the opportunity tonight. No problem, no problem. We it, thank we you so much hours. <laughs> for joining us, PJ. I, I genuinely appreciate your time. Oh, you're Definitely. absolutely welcome, and I appreciate the opportunity. Anytime, anytime. And like so, and, and you're always invited. So thank you. All right. Well. I will definitely see you uh, at RMAC. Bill will be yeah. there also. Sweet. Um, so, like always, you know, do enjoy life. Times are tough. If you want to disappear in a while, that's, you know, we, that's why we make these videos, the podcast. I appreciate Bill, and I definitely appreciate everyone who's been listening, who's been emailing, um, and all of our sponsors. Um, mm -hmm. We are so grateful for all of the sponsors uh, and their support and whatnot. So with that, I always want to say, stay geeky.